This is the General Overseas Service of All India Radio. Time by the studio clock is 3.30 hours IST, that is 22.00 hours UTC. Please stay tuned in for the news. This is All India Radio. The news read by Prashant Kumar Sinha. The headlines. Severe cyclonic storm Phylon reaches at Gopalpur and Odisha. Six people killed and over five lakh evacuated to safer places. Prime Minister directs governmental agencies to extend all possible assistance for safety of people in cyclone-hit areas. Convergence emerges on tackling terrorism in the Prime Minister's meeting with ASEAN leaders. And Maldivian President Dr. Mohammed Wahid announces his withdrawal from presidential election. Cyclonic storm Phylon, which made landfall with wind speed of more than 200 km per hour at Gopalpur in Ganjam district of Odisha last evening, has intensified into a very severe cyclonic storm on its way towards northwest. Ganjam, Puri and Jagatsingpur districts in many coastal towns are experiencing heavy rains since last evening. Electricity supply, road and rail connectivity have been severely affected due to this storm. Around 25 trains coming to Puri have been cancelled. The cyclonic storm has inundated several low-lying areas of the coastal districts. In the first reported deaths, six people were killed by falling trees in different coastal districts of the state. The Prime Minister has directed government agencies to extend all possible assistance to states to ensure relief and safety of people as Cyclone Phylon approaches the east coast. Earlier, Cabinet Secretary briefed Dr. Manmohan Singh on the arrangements made to deal with the cyclone. Briefing reporters in New Delhi, Home Minister Sushil Kumar Shinde said, 4 lakh and 50,000 people have been evacuated from Odisha and 1 lakh from Andhra Pradesh. He said two naval warships have been kept ready for undertaking evacuation process. The Home Minister said 26 teams of National Disaster Response Force have been sent to Odisha. 15 teams to Andhra Pradesh and two teams of this force have been sent to West Bengal. In New Delhi, Cabinet Secretary Ajit Seth took stock of the preparedness of various central agencies assigned to provide relief to those affected and to restore normalcy in the aftermath. Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh arrived in New Delhi, ending his four-day visit to Brunei and Indonesia. The, tip, the trip aimed at expanding India's Look East policy beyond economic ties with various countries of the region. Forging trade ties with the Asia-Pacific countries too was the focus of the visit. Dr. Singh held bilateral meetings with Prime Ministers of Asian superpowers like Japan and Australia on the sidelines of ASEAN and the East Asia Summit in Brunei. He also announced a separate mission for ASEAN, a 10-member bloc of Southeast Asian nations with a full-time ambassador. Besides, Dr. Singh also said that a free trade agreement on services and investments will be signed with ASEAN by the end of 2013 to boost Indo-ASEAN trade to $100 billion by 2015. A clear convergence of views on counterterrorism and security has emerged at the meetings the Prime Minister Manmohan Singh had with leaders of ASEAN countries during his visit to Brunei and Indonesia. Briefing newsmen on board the special aircraft while returning from Jakarta yesterday, the External Affairs Minister Salman Khurshid said that the ASEAN leaders expected more participation by India in world governance. Khurshid said the recent incidents at the line of control with Pakistan are upsetting and unwelcome. He said India wants normalcy at the borders and Pakistan Prime Minister's concern for better relations with India are welcome. He hoped the meeting of Directors General, military operations of both the countries, as agreed earlier last month, will take place soon. Khursid said, there are some unresolved issues at the border with China as perceptions differ, but there are mechanisms in place to deal with such issues. He regretted that some Indian archers could not go to China recently to participate in sports events due to lack of proper visas. Anand Sharma, Commerce Minister, also addressed the media and said that we have made progress in improving trade and commerce with Pakistan. This is All India Radio giving you the news. For news updates, follow us on Twitter at AIR News Alerts. You can also visit our Facebook page, All India Radio News, for more news and events. 
Maldives President Dr. Mohamed Wahid announced his withdrawal from next Saturday's presidential election. Wahid said he had taken this decision in the greater interest of Maldives. Wahid had come last in the polls last month with only 5% of the popular vote. The polls were, however, annulled by the Supreme Court on basis of a secret police report and fresh polls were ordered. All international observers had praised the elections, calling them free and fair. The Supreme Court also gave candidates the choice to withdraw from the election and directed that the entire re-registration process be done again. Election Commission has been working round the clock for the last few days to ensure the re-registration process. The United States has said that it will not route the financial assistance to help Syrian refugees through the Lebanese state and treasury. A statement to this effect has been issued by the U.S. State Department. The move is being seen as a setback to the efforts of the Lebanese government to raise funds to cope up with the rising influx of refugees from Syria. Lebanon hosts the largest number of Syrian refugees, which has caused a severe strain on its resources. The issue was raised during the recent visit of Lebanese Finance Minister Mohammed Safidi to Washington. Safidi had warned that Lebanon was not in a position to provide humanitarian assistance to the Syrians. Marathon negotiations on the draft of proposed Afghan-U.S. bilateral security agreement are on in Kabul between negotiators of the two countries since yesterday. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry arrived in Kabul on Friday and met with Afghan President Hamid Karzai. According to a press release issued by the Afghan President's office in Kabul, the two sides discussed the proposed bilateral security agreement. Presidential spokesperson Amal Faizi told reporters in Kabul that most of the issues relating to the agreement have been sorted out. However, deadlock continues over the issue of immun immunity to the U.S. soldiers from prosecution that stay in Afghanistan after the withdrawal of international forces from the country by the end of next year. In Peru, at least 49 people were killed when a truck careened off a cliff in the southeastern province of La Convención. The local mayor said that the victims include 12 children. The truck tumbled into an abyss in a remote area near the town of Suyukuyo and was carrying revelers. An investigation was on to determine if the driver, who was also killed along with his wife and children, was drunk at the time of the accident. In Iraq, a car bomb exploded in a crowded street in the city of Samara, north of Baghdad, killing 12 people and wounding 13. The blast came as people shopped ahead of Eid al-Adha. Militants seeking to cause maximum casualties frequently bomb places in Iraq where crowds of people gather, including shopping districts, markets, cafes and mosques. Violence in the country has reached a level not seen since 2008. This year's spike in violence, which has included a number of sectarian attacks, has raised fears of relapse into the kind of intense Sunni-Shiite bloodshed that peaked in 2006-2007 and killed tens of thousands of people. A French Algerian man suspend, suspected of Al-Qaeda links and deported from Pakistan this week has been charged with terror offences. Intelligence officials believe, believe Namen Mizish was once connected to Al-Qaeda's so-called Hamburg cell, which planned the 911 attacks on the United States. Deported on Tuesday, he was charged and remanded in custody in Paris for criminal conspiracy in relation with a terrorist enterprise to carry out criminal acts. Pakistani authorities had arrested in an operation near the Pakistan-Iran border in May 2012. North Korea has refused to sign a non-aggression agreement offered by U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry last week on condition of denuclearization. In a statement carried by the North's official state media yesterday, the National Defense Commission spokesperson said the U.S. should stop sanctions meant to punish its February nuclear test. Now to end this bulletin, here are the headlines again. Severe cyclonic storm Phylon reaches at Gopalpur in Odisha. Six people killed and over 5 lakh evacuated to safer places. 
Prime Minister directs government agencies to extend all possible support for safety of people in cyclone-hit areas. Convergence emerges on tackling terrorism in the Prime Minister's meeting with ASEAN leaders. And that is the end of this news bulletin. You are still with us on the General Overseas Service of All India Radio. Time yet again for the day's commentary on deepening engagement with ASEAN. Script is by Professor Rajaraman. Prime Minister Manmohan Singh's recent visit to Brunei to attend India, ASEAN and East Asia summits is poised to take India's Look East policy forward. Indeed, prior to his departure, Dr. Singh had announced that his visit has been at the forefront of its foreign policy and contribute to peace, prosperity and stability in the Asia-Pacific. Indeed, both Brunei and Indonesia are two important partners of India in Southeast Asia and that India's engagement with the ASEAN, a 10-member bloc of countries including Brunei, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar and the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand and Vietnam has remained the cornerstone of its Look East policy. This has leapfrogged into a strong, comprehensive and multifaceted partnership in recent years. There are twin purposes that define India's activism in foreign policy orientation, which is why India-ASEAN Summit and East Asia Summit means a lot for Asia's future. The first is that it is India's positive response to address the concerns of smaller Asian countries about China's assertiveness in the region and that India shares these concerns with them and therefore is on the same page. Secondly, as a rising economic power, India has been building up closer economic relations with the region and the trip is another attempt to enhance the level of these partnerships. Dr. Singh also discussed navigational rights in the South China Sea with the ASEAN member countries. Besides deepening economic ties, India has been also expanding cooperation in areas of security and connectivity. India's historical cultural roots with the region also help in realizing this objective. Dr. Singh's visit assumed further significance as India was looking to ink a free trade agreement FTA on services and investments by the end of 2013 with ASEAN. An FTA on goods is already in place between India and ASEAN and it has significantly helped expand the trade with this regional bloc. The ASEAN-India trade currently stands at $76 billion. It is targeted to be increased to $100 billion by 2015 and to $200 billion by 2022. Prime Minister Singh also discussed cooperation with East Asian countries in areas like drug trafficking, piracy and security issues. Integrating the economies of the region by trade and investment cooperation has been the most rewarding strategy in the 21st century for market economies. The East Asia Summit appropriately integrates a market of more than 3 billion people with a combined GDP of $17.23 trillion. The issue of gas imports from Brunei besides other areas of energy cooperation figured during discussion in Brunei. Mm -hmm. There remain some differences on the issue of FTA which needed to be addressed with certain urgency. Thailand and the Philippines had certain questions about the legalities concerning the FTA. Mr. Ashok Kantha, Security East in the Ministry of External Affairs clarified that the process of legal scrubbing of the FTA was already completed and the observations raised by the Philippines and Thailand had been addressed in the document. Mr. Kantha also clarified that India's position on the financy dispute was that India favoured protection of the maritime rights and freedom of navigation as per international laws. Since the first EAS summit seven years ago, the EAS has travelled a long journey and has emerged as foremost forum for promoting peace stability and prosperity in the dynamic Asia-Pacific region. Given India's vital stakes in the region, it has been closely involved in the evolution of an open, balanced and inclusive regional architecture on the basis of the centrality the ASEAN. 
international cooperation and integration and participating in the negotiations for a regional comprehensive economic partnership, RCEP, among the ASEAN and its FTA partners. The idea is to create a giant free trade area encompassing the major Asian economies by 2015. Such an initiative will help create an economic community in the region in the near future. Zaj was a day's commentary on deepening engagement with ASEAN. Script was by Professor Raja Ram Panda and it was read by Surya. This is the General Overseas Service of All India Radio.